Welcome back to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Very happy to be joined by uh, Jonathan Cohen, who's a clinical psychologist and an educator who's been focused on school safety and school climate and violence prevention. Really interesting and storied career, but I'd rather hear it directly from Jonathan. So Jonathan, welcome to Trending in Education. Thanks so much, Mike, for having me. Yeah, and uh, part of what got us connected is that you've recently co-edited and authored uh, a chapter and driven the development of a book called Feeling Safe in School that was released through Harvard Education Press. And I think that's going to be an organizing principle for for this conversation where what was covered in that book, it's really a a fascinating cross-cultural perspective on how 11 different cultures are addressing this broad challenge. And, and it's also tied to an observatory that you're very heavily involved with nowadays that, that we'll also dive into. But before we go there, we do like to hear from each of our guests in their own words, their hero's tale. So what is your origin story? What got you to this point in your career and in your life as, as someone who's focused on education? We'd love to get your perspective on that. In, in some ways, I suspect, like for many of us, an important part of my origin was my mother. My mom loved and loves learning. My mother was incredibly appreciative of the profound importance of people and the importance of being able to meet people and to appreciate relationships. I remember being a little boy and one day her talking a little bit almost with tears in her eyes And she said to me, Johnny, if there's any one thing that I want for you, it's that you can meet anybody and everybody, Mm. no matter what they look like, no matter where they come from, Mm. because people are so extraordinary. Wow. And at the age of six or seven, I didn't really understand what she meant, Mm -hmm. but I could tell that it was very important. (laughs) Yep. And... And I always held that in my heart. Mm -hmm. I also, I went to a series of wonderful schools when I was a boy and an adolescent Mm -hmm. who really cared not only about academics, but about social and emotional and artistic learning Mm -hmm. and always about the importance of kids gradually developing a moral compass. Mm -hmm. And those experiences with a series of extraordinary teachers really shaped my life and I was incredibly grateful to them. Mm -hmm. So that as I grew up and and became a young adult, my my first experience was actually being a teacher with kids in Los Angeles who had learning disabilities. Mm. And being a new teacher and being somewhat overwhelmed I found myself gravitating to the school psychologist because I was in trouble. I knew I didn't exactly know what I was doing. And this Nigerian man, Bill Weedy, was so helpful to me. And he not only helped me as a beginning teacher, but I began to learn about the fact that people could eventually get a job Mm. where you could talk to people and help them Mm -hmm. and if you had a question you could learn about that and that was called being a researcher right and if you had anything to teach you could actually have a profession Mm -hmm. where you were both a learner and a listener and a healer and a Mm -hmm. researcher i thought that sounded pretty neat yeah so i went to clinical psychology school in the 1970s Mm -hmm. I've always been involved with kids. I love kids. And Mm -hmm. I very quickly realized that if you love children and you want to support children's healthy development, it's essential to also connect with parents and with teachers. Mm -hmm. So when I went to clinical psychology school and I began to work with children, I also began to learn and work with educators in kindergarten through 12th grade schools. And that's continued to be a lifelong passion. Yeah. How do we build bridges, helpful bridges, between the education of children and mental health? Yeah. Because so often mental health problems on the part of kids and or their parents and or sometimes teachers become significant challenges for children learning. Yep. 
So for many years, I was a consultant in the public school world and in the independent and the parochial school world. I worked as a school psychologist. Mm -hmm. And then in the early 1990s, I was consulting at a school and I developed the idea that we should create a conference for teachers in this school and parents to help them think about what can we do as parents and teachers to raise healthy kids. Mm -hmm. And I realized as a colleague of mine and I were doing this planning, that these are such profound questions. What can we do concretely as a teacher, as a mom, as a dad, and an uncle and an aunt to support kids healthy development that it would be useful to have a national meeting, not just a meeting for one, one school. Yep. I've been for many decades an adjunct professor at Teachers College, Columbia University. Mm -hmm. And in a wonderful way, they've always allowed me to teach whatever I want and or to hold, create conferences about topics that I thought were important. Mm -hmm. And we organized a conference almost 30 years ago at Teachers College about exactly this question. What can we do as parents and teachers to intentionally work to raise healthy kids and to support their being able to learn? Mm -hmm. Much to everybody's surprise, over 500 people came from around the world to this meeting, mm -hmm. and both because it was a meaningful, rich, scholarly teaching and learning forum, mm -hmm. but also, frankly, I think because Teachers College made so much money on this conference, yeah. they asked me to organize a center. And I partnered with a guy named George Eagle, and also around 20 other concerned citizens, educators, mental health professionals, and we organized a center that for two or three years was located at Teachers College, Columbia University. And then a foundation came to me and they essentially said, John, what you're doing is really important because the spirit of the center was to build bridges between education and mental health, yep. to really support teachers and administrators appreciating that academic teaching and learning on the one hand, mm -hmm. and social and emotional teaching and learning on the other hand, in fact, always are joined. Yep. Whether we know it or not, as mm -hmm. parents and teachers, we're always teaching kids social and emotional lessons. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, and we wanted to really support people understanding how could they, both in the classroom and at the dining table, so to speak, mm -hmm intentionally help kids develop social and emotional and academic competencies in a more integrated way. Mm -hmm. And when this foundation came to me, this was in 1999, and they said, this is really important work, but you have to help us understand, John, what your business plan is. Mm. I said, what's the business plan? I didn't know anything about that as a clinical psychologist. Right. I had not learned about that. And they very kindly and helpfully gave us a fair amount of money to hire strategic consultants and business consultants. And that's what resulted in the center, which was called the National School Climate Center, mm -hmm. to grow. Because that business planning allowed me to begin to create with many colleagues and board members a whole strategic plan. Mm -hmm. And over the ensuing almost 20 years, we grew to be an organization that was helping schools and districts and state departments of education across America. Yeah. And then more and more, much to my surprise, foreign educational ministries around the world, yes, yes. thinking about what are they doing already in this realm of integrating social and emotional and academic teaching and learning, but also because violence in schools, bullying particularly, was such a growing sphere that educators were concerned about, what can they do right. to really address those problems helpfully and in a sustained manner? Yep, yep. So the, the National School Climate Center came to be an organization that not only helped schools and districts and state departments of education to be able to take stock and to think about what are we doing already to effectively promote social and emotional and academic teaching and learning? What are we doing already 
to ensure that hopefully all children, as well as all teachers and other school personnel, yeah. were feeling and were safe and feeling supported and engaged, and in an overlapping way to be able to anticipate helpfully and prevent violence of all forms. We also, as a center, helped schools and districts and states to measure school climate, which is a way of saying we can ask kids, students, teachers, parents, what do they think mm -hmm. about how the school is doing in terms of supporting everybody feeling safe? What do they think the school is and isn't doing in terms of supporting healthy relationships? What do they think about the, the extent to which the school is purposefully, helpfully teaching kids social and emotional as well as academic lessons or yep. not? Yep, yep. And then our center was also involved with a whole range of research activities and really supporting conversations between practice leaders and research leaders. And about four years ago, I stepped down from that position and now working with a group called the International Observatory for School Climate and Violence Prevention, mm -hmm. which is located at the University of Seville in Spain. Mm -hmm. The observatory is a network of national leaders from 18 or 20 countries that started about 25 years ago by two Parisian education professors. And it has grown up over the ensuing decades. And now I'm helping to carry on the tradition mm -hmm. of furthering meaningful research practice conversations, the, the observatory's website, which is still being built mm -hmm. today in early September, but should be complete by the end of October, is going to also include a growing number of tools and measurement systems that are going to be freely available mm -hmm. to school leaders and district leaders. There's going to be a growing number of conversations, not unlike the conversation that we're having right. with research and practice leaders from around the world mm -hmm. to really further practice and policy and research leaders being able to support one another understanding what can they do concretely mm -hmm. to further social and emotional and moral as well as academic teaching and learning and what mm -hmm. can they do systemically to support kids and adults in school communities feeling and being safer, more supported and engaged. Yeah, yeah, fantastic stuff. And I wanted to let you get through all of it because it's, I always think it's fantastic to get the, the full through lines of a career. And the fact, credit to you as someone deeply, deeply trained in psychoanalysis and to go all the way back to a, a conversation as a, a six-year-old with your mother, and then pull that all the way through to now. So I think it's quite a story and it's quite a through line really around making a positive impact in a way that continued to expand its focus to the point that now you're global. And I found that to be really one of the more profound parts of your book, Feeling Safe in School, is that I think we have a tendency to, to look at things through, a, in the US in particular, look at things through a domestic lens and not necessarily look outward and try to understand what's happening across the globe. And uh, it sounds like that's very much what the observatory is doing. And that's, that was very much what the, the focus of feeling safe in school is. And, and then at the same time, this pandemic has happened in such a way that I think we are being forced to think more globally. So I'd love to get a little perspective from you on some of the broader themes that are emerging as you look across. Some of it, I think, might be a little more focused on what's happening in the U.S., but I'm really curious, are there commonalities? Are there certain themes? Are there certain insights that, that are really valuable based on your experience being exposed to the breadth of, of the globe? There are. On the one end, here's the good news. The good news is there's a growing appreciation around the world that K through 12 schools can and need to teach kids more than just about reading, writing, and science. Yep. That's extraordinarily important because, as I said earlier, we're always teaching kids social and emotional lessons as yeah. parents, as educators. Mm -hmm. We don't often think about what are our goals? What are the competencies that we really care about? 
And I think mostly because there's now an extraordinary body of research about social emotional learning and character education and school climate or school wide interventions designed to support everyone feeling safer, more supported and engaged. Yes. yes. There is tremendous growing interest in this kind of pedagogy, these kind of educational goals. There's also, in an overlapping way, and an appreciation on the one hand, that social and emotional and civic or moral as well as academic teaching and learning always needs to be paired with larger systemic interventions designed to support people feeling more safe, yeah. more supported and engaged. As a part of that, there's a growing international awareness that we need to be paying attention to more than physical dangers. Yes. It was very interesting and exciting for me when Dorothy Espelage and I brought together this group of educational leaders from around the world. And as you mentioned, we focused on 11 countries in South America and North America, Europe, Australia, and Asia. It was very interesting to learn that in the US, we've been beginning to focus on social and emotional as well as physical dangers for over 40 years. Not that long, really, in the scheme of things. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, there are other countries, including, for example, France and China, that have only literally in the last handful of years mm. begun to appreciate at the national level that there are social and emotional dangers, as well as physical dangers that we need to responsibly think about, anticipate, address, and have systems in place, not only hopefully to prevent this, but also to understand how to most helpfully intervene when there is violence. On the other hand, what's problematic is that even though there is growing interest, there still is woefully too little being done, both in this, on this instructional dimension of intentionally being social and emotional, civic and academic teachers, and the systemic dimension. In the States, just to narrow the focus for a moment, mm -hmm. where there has been real interest in the social and emotional issues, Unfortunately, the primary school violence, school safety focus in the US now is on bullying, mm -hmm. on weapons in schools, and yep. school shootings. Mm -hmm. And bullying is unfortunately typically defined in the US and around the world in a very narrow manner that grows out of scholarly research into bully victim bystander behavior, namely, mm -hmm. Bullying is generally in the U.S. and around the world behavior where someone, a teacher, can say, one, this person is acting in an intentionally mean, cruel way. Mm -hmm. Two, that the bully has more power than the target. Mm -hmm. And three, that it's repeated. Mm -hmm. I think that's a useful definition for researchers. Mm -hmm. I think it's inadvertently an unhelpful focus for educators. Because in fact, there's a whole spectrum of experiences that undermine yes. children as well as adults feeling unsafe. Mm -hmm. From normal moments of misunderstanding, I say something, for example, that I don't mean to be hurtful to you, yeah. but it may land on you in a way that's hurtful. We all know from our friendships, from our romantic relationships, that's in fact normal. Yeah. We all experience those moments where the other person or we say something with one kind of intent, but the impact is very different. Mm -hmm. That's generally not addressed in schools. Mm -hmm. There's also all kinds of normal conflicts that can make the other person feel unsafe. Because in fact, even though civic educators for decades have been talking about the importance of teaching children to have difficult or controversial conversations, mm -hmm. that's something we're not doing well. Yes. The current state of America and a lot of the world, yes. where there is such a dichotomy between people from different political points of view and yes. seemingly a very poor capacity to be able to talk about those differences, it's just terrible. Yeah. 
there is also all kinds of fears, understandable fears that undermine children feeling safe in schools. Here's mm -hmm. one really important example, psychiatric problems. Right. One in five adolescents struggles with a major psychiatric problem. Well, if children don't understand what that means, it's naturally scary. Mm -hmm. And it inadvertently contributes to psychological psychiatric problems being almost taboo. Yeah. <clears throat> and for years, teachers would say to me across America and around the world, Dr. Collin, don't talk to me about mental health issues. I don't know anything about that. I wasn't trained in this. That's the job of the shrinks. Right. But in fact, educators are frontline workers. Yes. Educators have the opportunity to, and to see, to hear about problems that kids have. And although it's true that educators have been, been trained to deal with mental health illness, we need to be team members. We need to be partners, mm -hmm. educators, mental health professionals, parents, and the child. There certainly are many instances where kids are intentionally mean to one another. Right. That's often labeled bullying. Then there's a whole nother realm of violence that's only beginning to be talked about in our K through 12 schools, having to do with sexual harassment yep. and date rape mm -hmm. and what I sometimes call gray zone, sexual, social, and emotional experiences. We know that on college campuses, between one in four and one in five young women are date raped. Mm -hmm. There's actually now empirical research confirming that these same percentages apply in middle and high school. Mm -hmm. Between one in four and one in five yeah. middle or high school girls are date raped. Mm. And this is only just beginning to be talked about and is still in many ways taboo. That yeah. is terrible right because this is something that naturally undermines students feeling safe we all know intuitively if not from the research that if we don't feel safe right that's going to get in the way of learning yeah it gets in the way of healthy development yeah and then at the extreme end of this spectrum of experiences that can undermine children and adolescents feeling and being safe we certainly, unfortunately, do have incidences of homicide and suicide rates in America in adolescence and young adulthood is increasing. In yes. It's, it's frightening. Yeah, even pre-pandemic pre it was, and yeah, now, that's and now right. it's likely <coughs> and going to accelerate, yeah. And the pandemic, as you're saying, is making everything more challenging. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting and important for people to know about homicide and shootings in school is that although every time and unfortunately there's way too many shootings in sure. school in america because yes. we're so available mm -hmm. that gets tremendous press exactly what people don't appreciate often is that k through 12 schools are characteristically the safest place mm. that children spend time in mm -hmm number of shootings in the neighborhoods, in stores, in right. homes, mm -hmm. are probably 60 times higher mm -hmm. are in schools. Mm -hmm. But schools, but shootings in neighborhoods don't get any press. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's unfortunately, the focus on bullying, on weapons in schools, on school <laughs> shootings, is today getting in the way of educational leaders appreciating there's a much more complicated spectrum of experiences right. that we can and need to be paying attention to. And that was one of the issues that emerged in this book about these 11 countries. Yeah, it was one of the, just to build on that, one of the, one of the concepts that I thought was really insightful and powerful is the idea of perceived threat versus actual threat. And when you talk about school shootings, I still, as a child of the 70s, I still think back to duck and cover drills, which were kind of terrifying. They didn't happen too often, but when they happened, I was shook. And if they happened more often, I would have been more anxious all the time. I would have perceived that threat to be much greater. Now that the, the modern equivalent of that, except it seems to be much more significant, is the idea of these school safety drills 
and children are being taught by the mass media and I think also by their parents and educators who are being fed the same thing, that you're very much at risk of a school shooting. And in some ways, the perceived threat of that risk is probably more damaging to feeling safe than the risk itself. I, I really appreciate what you're saying, and I absolutely agree with you that unfortunately, too many district leaders, school board leaders and superintendents are investing today very heavily in what some people call the armoring of a school, mm -hmm. creating all of these systems to identify weapons and to do exactly as you were saying, what to do when there's a lockdown and so on. Mm -hmm there's more and more research showing that is unhelpful. Mm -hmm. It not only, as you're saying, Mike, undermines people being safe, but it's not even an effective strategy. Yes. Yeah, I saw that as well, where the punitive approach as, a, as an extension of this to a certain extent, rather by hardening the defenses of the school and almost adopting a criminal justice track for kids who are, are acting out, as opposed to something that's more about how do we build a school climate that is conducive to learning, feels like a place where th in some ways we're, there's a negative trend in, in our culture right now. And I'd love, maybe, could you expand a bit on that? Yeah, yeah. You're, I think, very importantly putting your finger on one of the concrete things that classroom leaders, that building leaders, that district leaders and state leaders can do to support kids feeling safer, namely to let go of punitive modes of discipline and classroom management. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in most departments of education and colleges of education still today, mm -hmm. we teach disciplinary practice in punitive way. Mm -hmm. We now have over 30 years of very strong empirical research that underscores that punishment can affect short-term behavioral control and change, mm -hmm. but in the long run, it makes things worse. Of course, teachers need to help children learn that behavior results in consequences. Absolutely. And that some behavior is not okay. When teachers learn about how to manage classrooms and to be a disciplinarian, in a manner that's first and foremost focused on learning rather than punishment, mm -hmm. it's infinitely more effective. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of other things in an overlapping way that we now know from an extraordinary body of research growing out of education in general, school climate, social emotional learning, mental health, and risk prevention. Mm -hmm. We know that just as health is more than the absence of illness, Feeling safe and thriving is more than the absence of the range of experiences that undermine feeling and being safe. Yep. We know that we can and need to be helping all children to learn socially and emotionally, civically and academically. Yeah. And there's now a tremendous body of research about the ways that we can be a more helpful living example or role model. Mm -hmm how we can utilize, as I was just mentioning, modes of discipline based on learning rather than punishment. Mm -hmm. There's a whole range of different kind of pedagogic strategies mm -hmm. from some relatively well-known strategies like conflict resolution training and cooperative learning mm -hmm. to many other pedagogic strategies, some of which are not so well-known like moral dilemma discussions. Yeah. Something that Larry Kohlberg at Harvard Mm -hmm. 40 some years ago began mm -hmm. to talk about and we now know is the single most powerful way to help children develop a moral compass mm -hmm. that pedagogically and very easily in language arts and social studies and history we can create opportunities for kids to struggle in the best sense of the word with a problem a dilemma that doesn't have a simple black and white answer and the point is to help kids realize that sometimes in life, we do have to struggle to figure out what's the right thing to do here when there's not a simple right or wrong answer. Yeah, I, and I found that to be, uh, maybe it's because I'm an optimist at heart, but a, a silver lining in the, the, the tumultuous year that we're living in, 
in that those conversations have to happen to a certain extent now. Like it's very difficult to avoid issues of race, issues of health, public health and safety, like to not have those conversations, to not be given the room to have those conversations seems like a, there, there's a risk of that happening, but the more that I'm talking to folks on this show, the more I'm realizing there's increased interest and hopefully increased permission to engage a little more on this front. Obviously, it's all limited in a, in a different dimension now by the fact that a lot of this is happening online, which is an, an entirely different Right. set of challenges but it does feel like there is a broader awakening of awareness on a lot of these themes that you were t- touching on the the stigma t- the, the level to which mental health is stigmatized seems to be diminished more broadly by the pandemic the broader awareness that we're all struggling with these things whether you're an educator a parent or a student that's something that does seem to be happening more broadly uh, there's an increased awareness about racial challenges and the fact that those conversations are going to be difficult, yet you still should have them. The same thing if you think about how the public health challenges and the, the fact that it's impacting different communities in different ways, there, there's more awareness of that. So what I don't think has happened yet, because it's still too soon, is that a thoughtful program to uh, almost reframe the role of the educator, very much the work that you've been doing, but it, I, I guess it, maybe a silver lining put differently would be, do you think there will be increased awareness and readiness to focus on the things that you've been focused on throughout your career in light of all the challenges we've been facing this year? I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, one of the things that I've learned as I've gotten older is that meaningful systemic change happens slowly. Mm-hmm. What you're saying I think is really true. I think that that this year the pandemic has been and continues to be extraordinarily challenging for students and for teachers alike in a variety of ways. And I agree with you. I think in a very positive way there's been much more conversation about stress and distress and problems and really how are we going to cope with problems. Mm-hmm. That's an incredibly important message. Because the truth is, or one truth is, that life is a series of decisions and problems. Mm -hmm. And there is good problems. What kind of ice cream cone should I have now? And there is challenging, difficult problems. And actually, several years ago, George Valiant, who's one of the stewards, the fathers of the biggest longitudinal study in the world called the Grant Study, which is a an amazing study that's been tracking a group of men who graduated from Harvard about 70 years ago, Mm. and another large group of men and women from neighboring, more economically disadvantaged communities. And in 2012, George Valiant published an amazing book called The Triumphs of Experience. And in this book, he says, the single most important social and emotional finding is that how we recognize and solve problems is perhaps the single most important social and emotional variable that shapes our lives. Well, in a certain way, that's common sense Mm -hmm. because we know that if someone is solving problems in an immature, unhelpful way, like I I don't have my homework because the dog ate it, that's a strategy, that's a immature problem solving strategies by mistake just create bigger problems. And on the other hand, when we learn to recognize difficulties, important decisions, problems, and to solve them in a more mature or adaptive way, by definition, we're really supporting ourselves being a learner. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and it looks like there will be plenty of opportunities for us to struggle with these things. What about the reframing the role of the educator and then the related point of the shortage of school psychologists that has been a challenge. Just having enough mental health services to scale, to reach the, the, the size of the problems that are out there, particularly if, you're, if we're expecting to trend around these emerging generations that they'll feel more anxiety, they'll, they'll be more social isolation, more stress in response to the, the pandemic and, and everything that's going on this year. 
how do we a support our educators so that they're able to be that front line that you were describing and then b scale up the the folks who are supporting and training and listening to the the humans who are on the front lines how do you see us charting a path forward for both educators and then school psychologists and folks who are supporting them i i think in some ways what's most important is that departments and colleges of education mm. intentionally train teachers help teachers understand what is effective and sustainable whether we label it social emotional learning or character education mm -hmm. or school climate improvement in fact concretely although those are three different camps and three different labels right leaders in character ed and school climate and sel are all in a wonderful way essentially saying the same thing mm -hmm. that a successful helpful sustainable improvement effort has to be instructional in other words teachers need to learn how to intentionally be social and emotional as well as academic teachers and learners mm -hmm. and that's beginning to happen more and more in very positive ways but that that's not enough the teachers and administrators also need to be thinking about what are the systems in place whether it's policy and or the measurement systems and or mm -hmm. leadership development systems both for educators and i hope for students mm -hmm. whether it's school family community partnerships we can take concrete steps in these different systems if you will that result in schools and school communities becoming safer more supportive and engaging climates for learning mm -hmm. so that's positive and i think communities need to really think about how can they support departments of education mm -hmm. and, our, and our local school community there was actually very interestingly this week in ed week there was a survey that came out that suggested that 74% of educators in america today believe that they're they're practicing social and emotional learning mm -hmm. that's positive and confusing in the following way it's yeah. positive because it's saying there really is tremendous growing interest mm -hmm in this whole world of integrating social and emotional and civic teaching and learning with academic teaching and learning yeah it's a little bit confusing because my experience and the experience of colleagues who were working with schools across america is that it's not true that three quarters of the schools are doing it i mm -hmm. think three quarters of the schools are beginning to yeah. do it mm -hmm. and there may be one teacher in the school yeah. who's for example teaching kids about mindfulness mm -hmm. or one school or one class or division that's beginning to do conflict resolution training that's all positive one thing alone is not the same mm -hmm. as setting in motion what i often refer to as a pro social that's a mm -hmm. kind of umbrella term to try to begin to capture sel and character ed and mental health and school climate improvement efforts mm -hmm. that that sustainable substantive pro-social school and pro improvement efforts is much more than what we're doing in the classroom alone yeah that's but these conversations are beginning to happen mm -hmm. and one of the extraordinary things about america just to talk about america a little bit more for sure moment, is our school boards really represent local democracy in action yes we all can have a voice so that anybody who cares about our kids and most of us care about our kids are literally our future yeah has the opportunity to say to our local school board what are we doing in these areas mhm mm is what we're doing research based right how do we have measurement systems in place so that we as a community can be ongoing learners mm -hmm. because we all know that sunsets may be perfect but people in schools always have problems right that's exactly. just the human condition we're all a little bit nutty yeah that's with a lowercase n that we all have difficulties and if you believe that mm -hmm. then to me what's important is what are our goals and how are we evaluating how we're being successful and where are the challenges mm -hmm. yeah it's the, the school board point's really interesting and it also brings me to uh one other 
I definitely want to get your sense of trends that are emerging. That's how we'll conclude. But the one other thing that I, you, you just mentioned, parents, and it does feel like this year has been transformative in terms of the role of the parent in the K-12 education uh, system. And hopefully in a positive way, although obviously there's been a lot of challenges there. And uh, I'd love to get a little bit of your perspective on that. You were really throughout your conversation, you were talking about how it's not just the teacher, it's not just the student, it's the community, but in many ways it is the parent. A lot of these teachings seem like they need to get to parents uh, as much as they need to get to educators. And I wonder if you have any perspective on that. I do. Historically and today, too many principals and superintendents don't really want to partner with parents. Mm -hmm. And that's partly because parents are they have yeah. their own voice mm -hmm. and they don't always go along with the plan of the principal mm -hmm. and of the superintendent. One of the things that I began to do when I was at the National School Climate Center, and I'm now doing with other school systems around the world, is to help school leaders understand how they can empower kids to take a simple survey out into the larger community, mo very importantly, talking with parents throughout mm -hmm. the community, but mm -hmm. also local law enforcement, local political leaders, local philanthropic leaders, and many others, and ask them two questions. What do you think, as a member of the community, and importantly as a parent, about the current school family community partnership? Mm -hmm. And two, would you be interested, as a community member, in learning about the school's improvement goals and helping. When kids ask those questions, mm. it supports parents becoming more involved. It helps the students, and I'm mm. obsessed with empowering students, yeah. supporting student voice, and supporting what I more and more talk about as intergenerational school improvement efforts. Yes. Which is, I think, one of the most powerful single things school leaders can do to really engage with kids and their parents mm -hmm. to be partners in the improvement process. Mm -hmm. So that we, based on their understandings about what's working and not working, school leaders collaboratively with parents and guardians and students delineate goals and think with parents and with kids as well as colleagues about how can we all work on this together? Mm -hmm. That's an incredibly exciting, powerful steps that school leaders can take. And now there's more and more guidelines that character.org, that CASEL, that the American Institute of Research, and many other organizations, in, actually including the International Observatory for School Climate and Violence Prevention, are putting out, making available as free resources for concerned mm -hmm. parents as well as educators. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. And that's part of uh, why we're, I'm really happy to get you on the show, just so that our listeners understand some of these resources that are out there, understand that there is a community of practice around getting better at this stuff. And I do, I, I, I guess I'm optimistic, but I do share your uh, perspective around this. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And we're in the heat of a very tumultuous year. So we may want everything to change on the dime, but it's probably not going to happen fast. But if we keep our eyes on the prize and continue to shine a light on where folks are doing things right, and that was very inspirational out of feeling safe in school, there are examples across the globe of folks who are getting this right. So if you're out there and you're trying to find your way, realize you're not alone. There are resources. We'll share them through the show notes. And, and it's been amazing having you on the show. But before we, before we let you go, I do love to always ask our guests, what else is happening in the world around us that is capturing your attention? Are there other trends? Are there other uh, things happening that we haven't talked about so far? Or if you just want to reinforce an aspect of what you've been focused on, are there any takeaways, like what's emerging in the world around us that you think are worth our collective attention before we uh, let you go? I think really, Mike, in a number of ways, I've already said it in the mm -hmm. following way. I think to me, the most exciting, important challenge is there's growing interest in social, emotional, civic, and academic education and as a more integrative teaching and learning strategy 
there's growing appreciation that we need to take steps to ensure that kids and the adults in school communities not only feel safe, but are safe, because mm -hmm. that is the essential foundation for learning and for healthy development. And I invite people to check out the website of the International Observatory for School Climate and Violence Prevention, as well as the other organizations that I've mentioned that have just extraordinary resources freely available for concerned citizens and educators. That's fantastic. Dr. Jonathan Cohen, the storied career, which we heard a lot about, I very much appreciate uh, getting you on the show. I'm sure our listeners appreciate it. Uh, the book is Feeling Safe in School. It's available through Harvard Education Press. Uh, we'll include the link to the observatory. And I held off on doing this, but I'd like to, just, I'd like to sing Whitney Houston. I get social emotional baby because I've been doing that for four years on this show. I didn't want to diminish the gravity of what we're talking about, but a little bit of lightness every now and then is great. Jonathan, okay. amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. I really appreciated being here. Yeah, and for our listeners, we'll be back again soon. Uh, we'd love to get your perspective on this and any of the uh, topics that we've been raising. Thanks as always for listening to Trending in Education.